Welcome to the Bibliotheca Orientalis. Today we have Magda Sibli, who is professor at Cardiff University. She will reply to some questions related to the Ammam. Not everyone knows what an Ammam is. Can you give us a definition? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Attilio Petrocciulli, for giving me the opportunity to share uh, with you and uh, with Bibliotheca Orientalis my uh, passion about Hammams. Hamams, uh, it's an Arabic word which means heat. So it's uh, related to public baths. Many people, when I say hammam, they would immediately ac acknowledge what it is if I say it's Turkish baths. Although not hammams are uh, Turkish baths because hammams are uh, public baths that have evolved from the small Roman baths called Banea. And they evolved uh, right at the beginning of the Islamic civilization uh, when the uh, capital city uh, was moved to Damascus uh, and uh, at the early stages of the Omeyyad period, we uh, witnessed the beginning of uh, a transition from Roman bathing or Byzantine bathing to Islamic bathing. And one of the early examples we can find is Qusayr Amra in what is known today as the Jordanian Desert. Uh, so public baths have evolved because of the need to uh, keep one, one's body clean for ritual um, ablution in Islam. And because in Islam people pray five times a day, they, will ha they have to do uh, uh, major ablutions and small ablutions. Major ablutions happen when people have, for example, sexual intercourse or they have been ill or um, the women had their periods, for example. So there are um, times where the whole body needs to be purified. And therefore, the, uh, the institution of public bathing was adapted, uh, adopted, uh, adapted uh, into Islamic civilization to provide the center for washing. And therefore, we find that these public baths are usually in the proximity of mosques and in every single neighborhood of all Islamic cities. So they are about bathing, uh, but men and women will bathe at different times. Uh, so they will either operate different times, or in some cases, there will be twin structures where you have one part which is for men and one part which is for women. And this is a, a, a prototype which we find mo mostly in the, uh, in Turkey, in the Ottoman Turkish baths in Turkey, where we have twin structures, but usually they are one structure and they played an important role in the social life of both men and women, because it used to be the only kind of public space where women could go and meet other women from the same neighborhood. Uh, and so it became sometimes even a condition for uh, for marriage marriage uh, contracts, that it was a condition that the woman would have access to the public baths once once a week, and her husband will provide for the paying for paying the fee uh, of this public baths or hammams are also known in the uh, Islamic tradition as silent doctors because of the role they have played uh, in the well-being and well-being both physical and mental there is a, a strong evidence that uh, the public baths, which are based on steam, so it's not uh, the hot, hot air, but it's actually steam, allows our largest organ, which is our skin, to, to eliminate the toxins through uh, perspiration. So in addition to the role of being an important ablution or major ablution space and its proximity to the mosque, it's also a well-being well-being for mental well-being for physical well-being but also for neighborhood well-being because it was the uh, newsroom of each neighborhood and what is interesting is that public baths existed in every single neighborhood of all islamic cities and they changed uh, in importance whether they are next to a large friday mosque or whether they are next to the souk or whether they are in the center of a small uh, cluster of courtyard houses. Um, and so today, they continue to play an important role uh, in parts of the Islamic world. 
are there local diversifications or is it an unaltered model in the Dar al Islam? That's a very interesting question. As I said earlier, when we, we say a hammam, people immediately think about the Turkish bath, which usually has got a central organization of a main hot room with small uh, rooms around it. But actually, uh, there is a diversification in the layout of hammams. They started as a transition from the Byzantine and Roman prototype, which is uh, the small banya, and they have uh, uh, they they don't use many of the kind of plunge pools that used to be in the Roman past, but they continue the uh, parallel succession of uh, rooms with increasing temperature and a main hall. And this prototype, we find it in two uh, areas. For example, the most known example is uh, Hammam uh, of Qusayr Amra in the Jordanian desert, where there is a kind of a, a hall of gathering uh, and uh, you have a succession of three parallel rooms with an end of floor heating system, which is called the Epochos. And that early example is then going to be continuing when the, you have the um, capital city of the Islamic world uh, or first Islamic dynasties, the Omeyyad dynasties in Damascus. And then the public bus started evolving with different influences. And this has been very well documented by Ecochar and Le Coeur in the 1940s when they analyzed about 45 maybe different baths from different uh, centuries. Uh, from the, the earliest is uh, uh, an 11th century bath, uh, which is in Damascus, uh, and uh, the latest towards the Ottoman bath. And here we can see very clearly the evolution of the plan of uh, the hammams, where uh, it can shift from uh, a series of parallel rooms, reminiscent of the Roman bath, to a more central organization, um, which is reminiscent of uh, the uh, kind of uh, Ottoman, Ottoman baths with the, the Eastern influence. Uh, the other thing that also changes is the proportion in the size of the room. Initially, the hot room is the main, uh, initially the warm room is the main, that actually continues to be the same in uh, the Maghreb countries, which are closer to the Roman uh, prototype. And then slowly, slowly towards the Ottoman period, it's the hot room which really takes the main uh, importance of the space. But we witness the same principle despite this variation of spatial organization where you have the hammam is constituted of two parts, the bathing, the bathing part, you've got the technical part where the water is heated uh, and the spaces are heated. So the technical part has got a different entrance with uh, an, uh, a delivery, uh, entrance sometimes uh, on a different street and then the, the bathing spaces which start with a bent entrance, a big uh, changing hall and then the bathing spaces with increasing temperature. And in that case, the, this kind of proto uh, organization is also um, continues with the end of floor heating system which then disappears in the case of the hammams of Cairo which rely on, um, on plunge pools or pools that receive the water from the furnace, which all of a sudden is located on the roof and the hot water is traveling through channels on the roof and then is um, allowed to, um, to fall into uh, small plunge pools. Uh, and these plunge pools will release the heat and release the, the steam. Whereas in the, for example, Syrian baths, we have the, the hot room is always next to the, of course, the furnace. So the journey in the hammam starts from the changing room towards the heat, towards the fire. So we are always walking towards the fire of the furnace, but we never, those space are never accessed. And from that furnace, you can have, you have three elements. You've got the hot water coming into the bathing space. You have the steam, which is released from the top of the water tanks that are heated. And then you have the smoke from
from the fire that heats the water and that goes under the floor and is extracted through chimneys uh, either at the end of the uh, warm room or the cold room, it depends. Sometimes it's just at the end of the hot, hot room, depending on the plants. So there, yes, so there are uh, interesting variations uh, over time. Uh, and the uh, prototype that remains unchanged is the one that is in Andalusia and in Morocco because it's the one that has not so much been influenced by the Ottoman bath and remains the closest to the, the small balnea with parallel small rooms, although the, the hammam is much smaller than the Roman bath. What are the chance of survival of the hammam today? And what are the adaptive reuses apart from the usual uh, transformation into a tourist restaurant? Thank you, Attilio, for this fantastic question, because this is exactly the question I was asking myself a few years ago uh, about, you know, how many uh, of these historic baths are surviving. And it was uh, the inspiration to apply for research grants, uh, which uh, I had a number of grants from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, as well as uh, from the EU, to uh, investigate the surviving historic baths of Damascus and Aleppo, that was in 2004, uh, and then uh, 2005, and then 2006 to 2010, I did a, a survey of all the historic paths of uh, Cairo, um, Tripoli in Libya, uh, Tunis in Tunisia, Algiers, Algeria, and Marrakesh and Fez in Morocco. And it became very clear that um, whereas the public baths of Syria and uh, uh, of Egypt are, are being completely, um, or not so completely, but to a high level neglected by the local population who think having a bath uh, at home is sufficient. Uh, we move towards the, so the, the baths are not really used for a kind of weekly visits as is in the Maghreb countries where the tradition continues to be a very strong intangible heritage and particularly in Morocco where not only do we find the largest number of still functioning public baths in the Moroccan medinas with the same system as the Roman bath, we're still using the hippocos and the furnace as in the Roman baths, but we also see that in Morocco, the public bath is integrated in the planning regulation of new housing neighborhoods, where it is a must to include a public bath uh, along with the mosque, along with the school. So uh, unfortunately, many baths have fallen into disrepair. They were never really protected as a heritage and one of my work is to try to increase awareness about the importance of this heritage, both tangible and intangible. So baths, if for example in Iran or in Turkey or in Syria or indeed in, in Cairo, that we only find very few that have survived and continue to work, but the majority are, have either disappeared or are, have been used as workshops, like wood workshops or uh, as a residence for, uh, in poor neighborhoods where people squat, or are, as you have said, uh, for tourism purposes, such as uh, restaurants and cafes, uh, as is for the case in Iran and Syria, for example, or um, uh, the kind of, the only use which is not so much about uh, kind of spaces of consumption is uh, cases of baths that have been transformed into museums. Uh, and because of their lighting system, you know, they, they quite, uh, or art galleries that, that you can find, for example, in Bursa or near Bursa, a case like this. What lessons can be learned from studying a month? Many lessons. Um, as they say in French, uh, on n'est pas sorti du bas, which means we are not out of the bath. I started my studies on baths in uh, 1994 of complete uh, nostalgia because I used to go to, to the bath with my grandma in Algiers and I used to spend a lot of 
good time with my grandma in the bath and studying the bath has opened, I'm still continuing to work on this topic and many people think I am very obsessed <laughs> with this topic, but I have learned so many things. There are so many things that are uh, very important and still very relevant today to today problems. The first one is health and well-being and that is uh, the bath is a, a space which is a, a convivial space so is where people come from different backgrounds, people of different ages, different uh, economic background and they are all equal in that space and that is something that has disappeared because many of those baths are now there is a proliferation of the spa industry where it includes Moroccan baths is becoming very fashionable but there is a major difference is that the bath is public bath is accessible to everybody and you can pay the price uh, according to the services but it's accessible to people of different background different age where uh, multi uh, different generations come together people from the neighborhood whereas the spa is a, a space where you have a solitary experience or maybe with a so you do not have this important interaction and as we are today experiencing isolation with COVID, we realize how much we are as social be human beings, that we really need to connect with each other. And the bath or the public bath was exactly doing that. It connected people of the same neighborhood. It provided social cohesion. It provided social support. The other thing that I have also learned, there are many lessons of sustainability which are embedded in this institution and what is interesting is that um, of the lessons of sustainability that i have learned from the bath is that um, it acts as a, a very high energy efficient uh, facility because the water uh, is heated centrally and it's also provided in countries where you don't have much rain so it's a very efficient way of bringing people to share uh, water and that is heated centrally. So in, today we have like district heating system where water is perhaps using biomass is heated and then distributed and this is being promoted as a sustainable solution. Well in the bath uh, people actually came to that shared resource and that was very sustainable. Another aspect that I discovered when I studied bath is that the, the, the furnace is amazing. The furnace of the bath is actually the recycling center for the neighborhood. Not only does it recycle the uh, byproducts bio from small industries, like the olive uh, presses, they re recycle the olive pits, the uh, wood workshops, they recycle the shavings, uh, and even organic material like uh, excrements from animals, whether for example horses or or um, camels, or they are also burned in the furnace to as a fuel. And the furnace also acts as a, a, a slow cooking kitchen for the neighborhood. So the ashes are then recycled, uh, their heat in the ashes is recycled to slow cook some dishes. And in, in Cairo, I found out that it slow cooked the full, which is a fava bean and uh, in big containers that are put overnight in the hot ashes and is ready in the morning for the whole neighborhood to share. And the same system I found it in Marrakesh where they use clay pots to stew vegetables and meat overnight. And this is a very nice delicatness uh, dish for, for, for people in Marrakesh. It's called the, the Tanjia Marakshia because it's in a, a clay pot. So here we are that the, the heating, the, the furnace is a recycling center and the public oven. And then you have the uh, changing room of the hammam. Here, for example, I live in the UK, the pub is a social space. The changing room in the hammam was the social space for men and women, of course, separately because they don't bathe together. But it was a space of a celebration, of uh, exchanging news, uh, of um, marking important events in the life of the families in the neighborhood like the birth of a child or the wedding or the circumcision or, or even the death 
So all kind of stages of life were celebrated in this. And so here we have an important anchor for social, cultural sustainability, as well as environmental uh, sustainability. Thank you very much, Magda. My pleasure. Thank you for giving me this chance to, uh, to talk uh, so freely about a topic which is very close to my heart. <laughs>